Good morning, Breakfast Club viewers. Welcome to episode 42. Uh, we are really excited to welcome Jonathan Young today, who is, hi Jonathan, <laughs> who is the uh, wildlife ecologist for the Presidio Trust, um, which is an organization and a place that a lot of people who don't live in San Francisco might not be familiar with, but um, for those in the city, uh, it is a, a gem and a really special place and a defining characteristic and so much about what um, people who live here love. So Jonathan, welcome. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe I'll just start by asking you to kind of enter or like give us an overview of the kind of stuff we'll talk about today. Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for joining. It's a lovely day out here in San Francisco. The air quality is actually pretty good. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking a lot about what I do here in San Francisco and my role as an urban wildlife ecologist. Uh, that might sound like a mouthful, but I'm really gonna get some some pretty good examples that I think you're gonna enjoy about all of the weird, wacky, wonderful wildlife projects that I'm doing here in San Francisco's Presidio, which is a national park. And I'm gonna give a lot of context around why this is important, specifically in San Francisco and more broadly globally, um, and a little bit of context of what the Presidio actually is. I know a lot of you may or may not actually know what the Presidio is, and it's a really unique, special place. So I'm going to start off with some of that global context, hone in on the local context, and then I'm going to talk more about myself, what I do, how I got started, and give some really cool examples of all the weird things I do. Awesome. So um, I'm. let me know whenever you want me to just okay. keep going. Okay, so I'll yeah, I'll throw your slides up on screen. Before that, though, I'll just say, so viewers, we're just gonna keep this kind of a really casual conversation today. So you're welcome to ask questions at any point. Um, if you're on Facebook, leave them in the comments. If you're on YouTube, leave them in the live chat. And okay, I'm gonna throw your slides up. There you go. Great. So um, yeah, again, uh, if I didn't already say this, thanks again for allowing me to give this talk. I've been, it's not, again, it's, it's less of a talk and more of a, conversation. So I'm hoping that you all out there viewing this right now, uh, this sparks some good questions and it can, it can kind of guide our conversation. But before I get into that, again, as I said, I want to give some context, uh, start kind of broadly and then zoom in on San Francisco. Um, I'm going to show a series of photo, photos right now, and I'm not going to say anything. I just want you to look at the photos and just, just absorb them. Okay. So I'm going to go through, I'm not going to say anything my uh, PowerPoint works. There we go. Okay, getting started here. Serenity now. So this is obviously what I'm trying to really get here is a lot of us, I'm assuming most of us watching this right now are urban dwellers. And across the planet, the human population is becoming more and more urbanized. So this is a really cool example. This is uh, 1950, mainly the main urban centers. And you can see the colors and the size of the circles represent population size and population growth. So 1950, here we are in 2020, you can see a tremendous growth in the urban centers. More humans are actually living in these urban areas. And in fact, more than 50% around 2007, I believe. And the trend is continuing. So over time, we're getting more and more urban people and less and less rural people, less and less people connected to the outdoors. And the few people who have the opportunities to go to these beautiful wild spaces, uh, again, that's few and far in between. You have to be fairly privileged to get out to these areas if you're an urban dweller, it takes a lot of resources. You have to have a car, you have to have the know-how, you have to have all the, all the funding it takes. It's, it's not easy. So a lot of these urban people are, are actually uh, fairly disconnected um, in, in some sense to the, the urban or the natural world. And we are, we're seeing a lot of um, this disconnect starting to, to reflect in how we, we view nature and science and conservation. And a lot of our urban nature is really fairly limited to some of these uh, vacant lots. They're uninspiring, unkempt, unhealthy, and unsafe even. And of course, kids, uh, urban kids have less and less exposure to these outdoor spaces. And instead of exploring and getting dirty and connecting to the, the natural world, a lot more screen time. Uh, scientists are calling this nature deficit disorder. 
And uh, a lot of these folks are growing up not knowing, not caring about nature because they just don't have a connection. But of course, science these days are really starting is really starting to show us that uh, access to natural areas is not just good for our physical health, but also our mental health. And even more so during these COVID lockdowns, I think this is really obvious to a lot of us, and especially here in the Bay Area, COVID lockdowns plus the the incredibly low air quality from all of these wildfires that were happening. Um, you can really get this sense. So a lot of this is very relevant right now during COVID. Um, but of course, other than the, the health benefits, the mental and physical, we have urban, urban nature actually provides a lot of services to us. And we call those ecosystem services. And I'm going to talk a lot about specific examples of ecosystem services throughout this conversation. But one really obvious example is clean water. We can all understand the value and benefits of clean water as opposed to scummy water, cesspools. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk a, very, a, lot, a lot about clean water and other ecosystem services. Um, so this is honing in a little bit now into San Francisco. Um, San Francisco has obviously not always looked like this, like it does here. And um, of course, people were living in the peninsula in the greater Bay Area for millennia. The indigenous Ohlone were here. Uh, through time immemorial, and really the, the the main changes in San Francisco started right after the gold rush, so around 1849, 1850, when the Europeans really started coming in, the, the Easterners from the United States started coming in and really changing the landscapes. So I just want to quickly go through uh, these lost landscapes of San Francisco, and you can see some of these dates in here, the 1800s. Um, you can see the dunes. This is all, San Francisco was about 70% dunescape. Lake Merced right here, for those of you who know, South west corner of the city. A lot of these nat natural annual dune ponds, which is valuable habitat for a lot of amphibians and other aquatic critters. This is another uh, example of many of the lakes that were lost in San Francisco. Another lake I'm going to talk a lot about today is the mountain lake right here. Um, and this is the outer sunset, what was once called the great sand waste, because again, it was just sand dunes and people didn't value sand dunes during those times. And this is a shot from the 1930s overlaid current contemporary neighborhood of the outer sunset. And this is one of the earliest depictions we have from an artist, 1816. And that's actually the main post of the Presidio. And that's the Golden Gate right over there to the right. You can see uh, the Marin Headlands out there, obviously before the Golden Gate Bridge was built long before that. And here we are today same relative angle presidio up there that clump and then the marine headlands and of course everybody's favorite the golden gate bridge up top and the bay bridge down there in the bottom and of course during that change of the landscape a lot of wildlife and plants uh, were lost whether they were lost specific to san francisco or whether they only ever occurred in san francisco and lost completely off the face of the earth for example this is the xerces blue butterfly these are actually specimens from California Academy of Sciences. This is the first documented butterfly species known to go extinct in North America due to human activity. And it was lost because of its um, habitat. The required habitat is dunes and San Francisco lost most all of its dunes and therefore the butterfly was lost as well. Gone off the face of the planet. It does not exist anywhere else in the world. It's fully, truly extinct. And then of course the not only the state bird, but also the city bird of San Francisco, uh, the California quail, gone. I think there's maybe one individual left in Golden Gate Park, but if you have one individual left, you can't have offspring, therefore you do not have a population. This quail, the species is gone from San Francisco due to habitat loss. So zooming in a little bit more into the Presidio, again, that's the Golden Gate Bridge right down the, the bottom center, looking south to the city. The Presidio is a 1,500-acre national park site, and it actually was founded in 1776 by the Spanish Empire coming up from down in the, the Mexico region um, and founded the uh, military base, which went through the Spanish Empire, the Mexican Empire, and then ultimately the United States uh, military took over. And in the mid-90s, the Presidio became a national park. And the majority of this national park is managed by the federal agency, the Presidio Trust, who's the agency that I work for. And the National Park Services are, are close collaborators. They manage some of the coastal regions. Um, but uh, the Presidio Trust really inherited a, quite a mess. The, the military did not export any of their garbage, for example. Um, 
including a lot of their munitions. And we are actually still uncovering and digging up these unexploded ordinances, including things like mustard gas canisters and uh, grenades and things like that. So a lot of, and, uh, again, chemical weapons, a lot of dilapidated buildings. Um, so the Presidio Trust really inherited something that the military really, uh, you know, changed the landscape dramatically. Um, but not only, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because the, the, the military's presence, although they literally trashed the landscape, they also prevented the complete loss and development of some of San Francisco's remnant natural habitats. And this is one example of the serpentine grassland. This was never developed over. So this is what it would have looked like for thousands and thousands of years. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but the Presidio Trust really inherited uh, again, the mid 1990s, kind of a, a bit of a mess. And so they began to clean that up and restore a lot of this habitat, which I'm gonna talk about. And we could not do any of this work without volunteering. So a lot of this volunteer, these programs started in the 1990s and have since changed the landscape dramatically. Um, but first I just, before I go into these, I just wanna really define what restoration is and really kind of define it by what it is not, um, at least how I see it. Restoration is not recreating the past. Recreating the past is not functionally possible. It is the way our infrastructure is set up, the way all these limitations around how everything is in 2020, you cannot fully go back to what it once was. And, and what do you go back 200 years, 2000 years, 20,000 years? You know, how do you define that? So what restoration is to me is uh, restoring ecosystem health and ecosystem function through using past conditions as a reference to, to guide and to plan what is the potential for this place, knowing full well that you can never go back in time. Um, and again, volunteers are key and we wanna promote ecosystem complexity because complexity in the ecosystem equals ecosystem resilience, which means as our climate continues to change, we can we can maintain a healthy functioning ecosystem and primarily through, through maximizing biodiversity, which I'm gonna talk very specifically about. Um, so for the first 20 years, I just want to give a really cool example of, of general habitat restoration. And I'll just say, and I'm going to get more into this in just a second, but first 20 years of the Presidio's history as a national park, there was no dedicated wildlife staff member. So a lot of it was focused solely on restoring the plants and the abiotic, the non-living components, such as water. And this is one cool example of what we call a daylighting of a creek. So right here, what you're seeing is underneath this, this is about 2007-ish time time frame. This was a creek at one point that was put into a pipe and buried so that the military could create a shooting range. This is just a shooting range. And, and I just want you to look at this. This is a fairly uh, low diversity field, right? It's just a, some low growing grass and some ivies and some other things like that. So here's a time lapse I want to share of the uh, daylighting of this creek. So I'm going to hit play and I hope this works. Here we go. So digging it up, finding the pipe that was, again, the military put in, I think around 100 years ago, sculpting this meandering creek. Again, you got to worry about erosion, so you have to really work with some engineers here. Planting it with native plants. And again, this is from 2007, so you're seeing it through the years. A lot of willows. This is what we call a willow riparian habitat. Um, and I'll just say we monitor the vegetation change through time. And most relevant to me is we monitor the bird communities through time. I'll talk more about how we monitor these things, but you can see the complexity of the habitat completely changed. Now we have all kinds of plant diversity, which provides resources for the wildlife, such as the birds. They need the structure to put their nests in. They need the berries to eat. They need the insects to eat that are associated with these native plants and, and things like that. So just one, one quick recap. That's what it used to look like. And that's what it looks like now. Wow. Um, just to your left down there is the bay. That's Christy Field. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so again, simple to complex. Complex ecosystems means more checks and balances, means higher resiliency, especially during our changing climate, and higher biodiversity results in higher checks and balances and resilience. So now that was all the context. So this is now I want to focus on, on what I do and a little bit about where I come from and uh, and then talk about the examples that I um, have to share with you. So I'm actually uh, native to Los Angeles. I grew up in Southern California. I got my undergraduate degree at San Diego State University in uh, biology. 
came up to the Bay about 12 years ago and started volunteering in the Presidio as a habitat restoration steward. Just wanted to learn more about these strategies and these the different approaches and learn uh, to restoring native plants and animals and learning native na the native plants because I didn't know the native plants of the Bay Area. Started as a volunteer, ultimately got an internship in the Presidio. And that internship was primarily habitat restoration and, and it just fortuitously, I was in the right place at the right time, expressing my interest in graduate school and was able to extend my internship while being a graduate student at San Francisco State University, where I studied um, disease, ecology, and amphibian conservation. And so just really quickly, there's a, a nasty pathogen, a chytrid fungus that's being spread around the world and just devastating amphibians across the planet. And so my graduate research was to look at the historic introduction of the disease into San Francisco around the 1970s is when it came in mm -hmm. and the spread of it across the landscape of San Francisco. And ultimately the plan was to understand this very important disease and how to apply it to the restoration and conservation of amphibians here in San Francisco. And I can talk more about how that actually has been applied in some of the amphibian restoration projects that I'll get to in in a, in a minute. Um, but I just want to, I just also want to shout out to Cal Academy because the the value and the benefits of museums are just, you can't even put a price tag on this. A lot of these collections from 100 plus years ago are invaluable. The amount of information, not just the, the voucher of the species, when and where it was found, but also all the microbes that are associated with that species that who would have known 150 years ago collecting a salamander, a grad student in 2015 was gonna swab it and you can actually find the diseases on its skin, such as chytrid, that nobody knew was even there, you know, 50, 60 years ago or however long it is that you're looking back in time. So it's more than just the specimen itself, it's also everything that's associated on that animal and in that animal. So Cal Academy, priceless. You're doing the world a huge service by, by what you're doing. All museums are. Um, so again, just a, just a quick recap before I get into some of these specifics. The Presidio is a national park. We have federal mandates that we are required by federal law to see th that we succeed through time. And that, in, from my perspective, is to maintain and increase native wildlife through time. We want to keep the wildlife we have. We want to increase that where and when we can. And we also want to uh, promote a healthy environment through robust wildlife communities. So I'm going to talk all about how we do that and how we monitor these things through time. And again, management. How do we manage these communities through time? Management is the application of science. So what is the contemporary, most current science on wildlife, specific species, etc.? And how can we apply that known science to improving and increasing wildlife species in this park? So that is a really big part of my job. And that is really what the essence of urban wildlife ecology is, understanding how these animals interact in our human dominated landscape, how are they doing, and what can we do as managers to improve their, their sustainability through time. So that's what I'm gonna talk about specifically uh, awesome. now. So I'm just gonna keep on moving. And, and it, when you have questions, Shout them out and I will address them. Gabe was curious. Um, the idea of lost landscapes is obviously really, really powerful, but he wanted to know whether that's also a technical term that people use in conservation. Okay. No, it's a, it's actually a reference to a really cool uh, sh film showing, annual showing that they do in the Castro Theater that I recommend anybody look into it. Of course, it's going to be changed this winter, but they just show historic uh, scenery of San Francisco going all the way back to sometime one of the first cameras were being used in San Francisco. So it's kind of just a, a reference to a really cool cultural thing in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, so moving forward, a lot of what restoration ecology is about is this really simple idea. If you build it, they will come. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the different components of restoration ecology, but this is kind of the, the really the simple mantra of the basic mantra. And as I said, 20, the first 20 years of the national the Presidio as a national park was fully focused on restoring the vegetation and the abiotic, the non-living components, the water and the soils. 
And here's a really cool example of if you build it, they will come. A lot of wildlife birds are the obvious example. Uh, they're very mobile species. Not all of them, like quail, can't fly very well, but things like this western bluebird can fly, obviously, long distances. And if it doesn't have the appropriate habitat, it's not going to stick around because it just doesn't have the resources that it needs to survive and to thrive. So western bluebirds obviously used to be in the, the, the peninsula and this in San Francisco and the Presidio. And then, of course, again, the lost landscapes concept, habitat was lost. And these birds were actually fairly rare in the Presidio. Um, and it wasn't until the restoration began in the early 2000s, again, the bringing back of the resources that this bird requires, uh, it really brought back this bird. It came back on its own and is now very common in San Francisco, or excuse me, in the Presidio. Not so much in San Francisco overall, but in the patches of habitat, such as the Presidio, this bird is now very common. Um, and so this is a, a, a secondary cavity nesting bird, which means that they can't build their own cavities. They actually rely on taking the rejected or old un, or old used cavities that the primary cavity nesters, such as woodpeckers. We all know woodpeckers. They're notorious for making these cavities. Um, they use them and then they leave and they abandon them. Birds like this, bluebird, is again, a secondary cavity nester. They don't have the, the beak power. They, they can't do what, what woodpeckers can do, but they need those cavities. So if you don't have the trees, the types of trees that the woodpeckers use, then the there's no cavities, there's no bird uh, bluebird habitat for the bluebirds to actually reproduce. So here's a really cool example of um, how we manage these secondary cavity nesters in this urban area. So. The Presidio in San Francisco was planted by a, a lot of non-indigenous uh, trees throughout the late 1800s, including blue gum eucalyptus and specifically Monterey pines and Monterey cypress trees. And those trees are federally mandated as historic forests generally in the Presidio and are main maintained and managed as historic forests. There's a lot of controversy around them that I won't get into, but a lot of those dead and dying pines are actually really important for primary cavity nesters such as um, the woodpeckers and then again it, it cascades down to these secondary cavity nesters but the problem is when those dead and dying pines start to get to that state at the end of their life life state life cycle they create a public safety issue right because who wants a giant huge dead pine tree that's going to eventually fall into your house your car or god forbid your family so our forestry crew has to go in, identify these danger trees and chop them down before they actually fall and hurt somebody. Um, so in so doing, you're removing this habitat um, and therefore you're decreasing the availability of nesting habitat for a lot of these secondary and primary cavity nesters. So what we do here in the Presidio is we actually will mitigate for the loss of this habitat type. And we started this pilot program of these artificial nest boxes. And you can see this was actually this year, the last two years, I should say, uh, we, we've actually gotten a lot of success. We have a house wren here on the, the left side, which are not that common breeders in San Francisco, just again, lack of habitat. And then on the right, we have tree swallows. Um, and so we're, we're really kind of trying to target all primary cavity nesters. We're starting this program, which ultimately we hope to create into a community science program, have trails that people can walk and a, and a protocol to follow to actually monitor uh, who's using these, these different um, um, structures that we're putting out. So again, this is a way that we are able to mitigate and balance the fact that a lot of these dead and dying trees, they have to go, but we don't wanna lose that habitat. So how do we do that? So this is a really cool example of mitigating these, this human dominated landscape. So another example, if you build it, they will come. This is the, the green hair streak butterfly, a dune obligate. Uh, this, the host plant of this butterfly is the uh, coast buckwheat. And so just to, to explain a little bit what a host plant is, these butterflies evolved over millennia with certain types of plants. And each plant has a different kind of chemical makeup in it. And these butterflies, all butterflies generally, um, some, some are generalists, meaning they can lay their eggs on almost any plant generally. And some of them are specialists like this uh, green hair streak. It actually can only lay its eggs on a certain type of plant and those eggs hatch and the caterpillars can only eat a certain type of plant. So if you don't have the host plant of a certain butterfly, you will not have the butterfly. It's 
it's you have to have both of them to have the butterfly otherwise you, you don't have it so the again, as i said earlier across san francisco was about originally 70 percent dunes including all of the dune vegetation associated with that and that was mostly lost there are little patches left in san francisco including the presidio and through our habitat restoration we've increased the host plant of this green hair streak and in so doing this green hair streak has started to spread across this dune habitat this restored habitat and now we're seeing this green hair streak is far more common in the Presidio than it once was. It's actually spreading and hopping to these new sites. It's a tiny little butterfly. It's about the size of a, maybe between a dime and a nickel. But as you can see, a very beautiful butterfly. But if you don't have the host plant, you're not gonna have the butterfly. So a lot of that is building it, building the habitat, restoring the habitat, bringing back and encouraging and increasing the native plants. And you're gonna get a lot of these these things that are that are either either just barely holding on, like this butterfly was. This butterfly cannot fly across the city of San Francisco. It's way too small to do that. It stays fairly local. But it was there in the Presidio, just barely holding on to the little bits of dunes that were left. So as we start to expand those dunes out with the appropriate plants, we we're seeing the, the wildlife, including this butterfly, starting to spread and increase through time. It's really cool, very encouraging. Um, to see all this stuff. Another really cool um, project that's happening right now. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this area of the Presidio, just there in the middle of the screen, uh, just above that little road right there is Chrissy Marsh, Chrissy Field. We, for those of us who are familiar, we're aware of that marsh area. Um, what I want to talk about is really on this kind of front and center area. This is what we're calling Quartermaster Reach. This is a, a, a tidal wetland area that actually connects to Chrissy Marsh that we're currently building right now. It's about seven acres. And we just installed those tunnels or culverts that you see under that road right there that connects it to Chrissy Marsh, which is connected ultimately to the bay. And um, just upstream of this is that, that creek that I showed earlier, the time lapse. That creek is just upstream of this. So this is a really unique habitat that we are creating and restoring where freshwater meets bay water, what we would call brackish water. And so we're doing that right now. It's literally under construction right now. In November, we're gonna move in and we're gonna start planting with native marsh plants. But the really cool thing that I'm working on as part of this is the uh, restoration of native Olympia oysters. So you can see oysters right here. A lot of us are familiar with these. These are the native Olympia oysters. Uh, they're about the size of a silver dollar, so maybe uh, two at max um, uh, size about two and a half inches wide and um, you can see what they do they 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 as most of us know they they land and grow on structures and if you don't have structures you can't get oysters growing because they attach themselves and create this this feedback loop they actually um, the planktonic larval stage is floating around the bay looking for structure to land on and glue itself to and then growing into what we know as oysters once they're attached they're permanent and they they settle on a variety of things and you'd be surprised i've heard of car batteries that are thrown in the bay oysters will settle on them and grow on them but really what attracts them is other oysters the calcium carbonate in their shells attracts the planktonic the larvae and it kind of creates this feedback loop. You get more oysters growing, more calcium carbonate, attracting more planktonic recruitment or settling, creating these, what we would call as a reef, a big structure. So these things are what we call ecosystem engineers. Twofold, they are filter feeders. So they are constantly filtering the water, which can have an impact, especially if you get a lot of oysters, you can have a, an impact on the water quality because they're removing particulate matters from the water. But also this ecosystem engineer component concept is they create this, what we would call reef structures, right? And this reef structure is really important for a lot of other critters in the intertidal and subtidal zone because these, this structure, all of these nooks and crannies, all of this asymmetrical complex structure that these oysters create is hugely important for juvenile fish other invertebrates like crabs and even areas for seaweeds and things to grow on. So it creates this cascading effect in the system of, again, just the structure itself is huge for a lot of other wildlife um, and things like algae seaweeds to, to grow and to use. So uh, Jonathan, ecosystem, yes. 
quick question about the structure. Yep. Do they, what are they made of or do they include? Ah, mm -hmm. Check it out. So okay. we are actually building these, what we call oh, reef wow. balls or reef domes. And you can see in the far back behind the title, there's a big pile of oyster shells. We've actually collected those from local restaurants. Those are the, the imported um, non-indigenous oysters, but again, calcium carbonate. So when we get them from local restaurants, we need to sterilize them because we don't want to bring a bunch of weird pathogens from wherever they were harvested, which could be literally on the other side of the world. Um, but what we do is we crush them up, we mix them with cement. Again, the calcium carbonate is, is hugely attractive to these planktonic oysters. And then you can see here, we create these, they're, they're, they're hollow. And hollow is really important because it, it allows for currents going through there, creates more structure and more nooks and crannies, not just for the oysters, but for all these other marine invertebrates and marine vertebrates that we, we want to attract to these areas. Um, so you can see what we're going to be doing is we have about 80 of these reef balls right now that are roughly the size of a basketball. We're going to be taking them probably next week into the quartermaster reach site. As again, as I said, there, there literally is heavy equipment in that area right now, digging out and, and sculpting the area. It's just raw dirt right now. We're going to be stacking these up as, as, as a, again, as a, as a kind of a reef. And then we're going to be opening up that culvert, allowing the bay water and the freshwater to come and meet bringing in all of the planktonic larvae that are in the bay water as well. So we're going to be monitoring these through time. Um, and we are encouraged by our pilot results in the marsh itself that we've been doing now for about a year and a half. A couple of these have been deployed and we're seeing recruitment of oysters. So the oysters are there. They just don't really have the place to settle. So again, it's, it's really, if you build it, they will come. They're there. They just don't have a place to settle. So right. This is what we're doing. Um, it's a really cool example, and we expect to see a cascade through the ecosystem, through the the, the, the deployment of these structures. And Deanna had a quick question: Are, yeah. are those oysters native to the entire West Coast, or just our Bay Area? Uh, from Baja, California, up to uh, Puget Sound area. I believe they're up in potentially the Vancouver Island area, but I'm definitely way up into the the northern tip of um, Washington. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so another component of wildlife ecology and what I do here is, again, the federal mandate of the national park is to uh, maintain and enhance the, the, the wildlife, the native wildlife through time. And so how do you, how do you know how, how these wildlife communities, these, these mixtures of species, how do you know how they're doing? Um, you know, you walk outside, oh, I see a bee. Is it, does that mean that's the last bee ever of that species? Or does that mean that they're thriving? Well, in order to actually answer that question, you need to monitor that. And in order to monitor that, you need to have a standardized, scientifically approved protocol so that you can track the populations of these species through time and actually say with statistical rigor, they're doing okay, they're declining, or they're increasing. And monitoring is a huge part of this because, again, we want to we don't want to know just that they're doing fine today. <clears throat> we want to know, yeah, they were doing OK a couple years ago. They're doing better now. They're going to be doing even better in the future. And if they're not, what can we do to help nudge that trajectory in, in, a, in a direction that we want? So what can we do in terms of management? <clears throat> a good example is that green hair streak butterfly. We knew that if you plant the host plant and all the other resources, like the nectar resources that the adults need, that's a management action that we can take. So we grow native plants in our native plant nursery. We plant those. And through time, we see the trajectory change of these species. So a lot of this monitoring is something that I can't do as a single individual. It's a lot of work. So what we do is we work with collaborators, including people at California Academy of Sciences, and other local universities, such as San Francisco State University and UC Berkeley, you know, there's a lot of universities in the Bay Area and obviously beyond. And we 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 collaborate with a lot of these scientists because um, it's a lot of work to to monitor these trends through time and specifically these really obscure invertebrates. Um, I'm not even sure what this bee is. I took this photograph, but it's a really great example. A lot of these inverts is probably the the biggest portion of biodiversity in the Presidio is invertebrates, other than the microbes, of course, but the macro scale things, invertebrates. But the thing about invertebrates is they're very hard. They're notorious, uh, notoriously hard to identify 
a lot of the bees diversity specifically, there's very few people in the world that can do that. So reaching out and collaborating with a lot of these scientists, again, like the California Academy of Sciences, help us really understand uh, what species are actually here. Because you can see the bees, but is that, what kind of bee actually is that? Some of these bees are tiny, tiny little things. So collaborating with professionals is huge. Understanding what is here, what is the diversity that is here, and how does it change through time? And if it's changing for the negative, what can we do? How do we apply science to the real world to change the trajectory? And again, here's another really cool example of obscure invertebrates. Beautiful. There's some very beautiful invertebrates. Yeah. And we're still just learning. Again, it's, it's since the mid-90s, we've been start we've been starting these inventories. And we're still, we have a long way to go. We know the bigger things like the mammals, because we can see them. Oh, that's a raccoon. That's a coyote. That's a skunk, et cetera, et cetera. But the invertebrates are really the hard ones to get. And there are so many. There might even be species of invertebrates in the Presidio that have yet to be described to science. So that's a really cool, exciting thing that we're hoping um, to, to start to uncover. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Another monitoring that we do through time that's really important is um, this is an example of using modern technology. So we, we, we use um, cameras to monitor wildlife. And this is one example of using a live stream to monitor our local raptor nests. And this is a red tail hawk, which are fairly common in San Francisco. Um, we, we streamed it through YouTube Live. This was a couple years ago. And um, this was an international hit. She uh, successfully, or the pair successfully fledged two red tail hawk um, babies. And we also use these as opportunities to share with the world a really important idea. And I talked about this just at the beginning of this talk is uh, ecosystem services. So you can see what's in her talons right there. I think that's at least two rodents. And um, watching these, these, these birds, these raptors feed the uh, voracious appetites of these babies through time, incredible the amount of rodents that they had to bring to keep these chicks fed. And this is an example of an ecosystem service because these predators are, are feasting on and controlling the populations of what we as humans consider pest species. So gophers and rats, things like that. So this is an ecosystem service because they are actually controlling, helping us control these, these species that we, we deem as pests. And another opportunity to educate the public is, what do you think happens when you try to use rodenticides, poisons, to kill rats and then predators eat those rodents and feed those contaminated rodents to their babies. It goes through the, the food chain, right? And so you, you start to see, and we actually monitor. When we find dead raptors and dead, dead uh, other dead predators like coyotes, we actually will send them to the state and they will test them. And we found dead raptors like owls and, and hawks that actually died from rodenticide poisoning. It's not allowed in the Presidio, but a lot of these rodents can come in from outside the Presidio where citizens of San Francisco can use these rodenticides and thus contaminating the ecosystem. So using these opportunities to show the direct con connection to the public that rodenticides are bad, don't do it. Our native predators are helping us control a lot of these, these um, pests that we, we, we really don't like in a lot of our areas. Um, so monitoring through technology and I have some other examples of, of using technology to monitor some of our other wildlife, but switching gears here a little bit. Uh, the, I'm talking about a lot of these local species, um, but of course the Presidio is not limited to those animals that only live and occur in the Presidio. There are a lot of migrants that come through the Presidio, and the Presidio is an incredibly important resource for these long distance migrants to actually stop over and to whether that be for nesting, such as this violet green swallow. These swallows fly all the way up from Latin America to nest here in the Presidio. And not only are they nesting in a lot of our historic buildings, but they really need the insect abundance to feed not only themselves, but also their growing chicks. So again, restoring the ecosystem, you're gonna be getting a lot more insects. And those insects are resources for things such as this, this violet green swallow. Um, and so the Presidio is part of the Pacific Flyway, which is, shown here. A lot of long distance migrants use the coast to, to navigate their long distance migrations. And whether they're coming directly to the Presidio to, again, whether that be a nesting swallow that's coming to the Presidio 
for that specific reason, or whether they're passing through and just stopping over to recharge, to rest, to eat, to refuel, and then to continue on their long distance migration. We want to be able to provide those resources so that these animals can continue to through time, their generations or their migrations or both. So not only is it birds, but we also get bats that migrate through. And um, not only are we getting vertebrates, but we also get a lot of invertebrates as well. And uh, not all migrants have backbones. <laughs> these invertebrates, these, these are one example, monarch butterflies can come as far as the Rockies and they overwinter on the coast of California because we have such mild winters. And it's quite an interesting example. I talked a little bit about the non-native eucalyptus. These, this is what you're looking at here are eucalyptus trees. They are from Australia. They were planted in the, by the military in the late 1800s. And now we have these massive forests that were never here historically. For thousands of years, they never were here. But it turns out that wildlife, some wildlife actually use and and, and can thrive on these totally novel trees that were never here before. And this is one example. Uh, they come, the, the monarchs are really pretty sensitive about their microclimate. So they actually need these trees to block the wind, for example, to, um, to bask in the sun, to regulate their temperature, etc. But the one thing, again, these trees are notorious because they're highly invasive and they can actually also be a uh, fire hazard. So we in the Presidio have a forestry team that manages our historic forests. Again, there is a federal mandate that designates these forests of eucalyptus trees as a historic cultural component that have to be managed indefinitely through time as historic character. But a lot of these are hitting the end of their life cycle, about 100 plus years, and they're starting to die. So the forestry team actually replants a lot of these forests with eucalyptus trees. Um, so we need, they're going to be here for indefinitely, but how can we manage these forests to increase and improve habitat for wildlife, such as these overwintering monarchs? And we know a lot of the science of what these monarchs want for the overwintering habitat. And so we collaborate with science, scientists to help inform our forest management to, again, within the framework of our federal mandate of managing these forests through time. But how can we tweak the forest management to increase monarch overwintering habitat. So selective thinning and creating these microclimate habitats where they can shelter from the wind and they can get the dappled sunlight that they need. And even in so doing that, we've actually been experimenting with what kind of native plant understory, what are the shade tolerant native plants that can thrive under these tall canopy non-native eucalyptus trees. And so we've been experimenting and actually finding a really high success with a lot of native plants. Again, these native plants provide a lot of the resources that a lot of these animals need, such as nectar from flowers and berries as fruit from the fruiting. Um, so managing these non-native forests to increase and improve wildlife habitat is um, really cool, especially for these long distance migrants. As, as we all know, my, uh, my monarchs on the West Coast have taken a precipitous decline. They are on the verge of extinction from the West Coast, not from the planet, but from the West Coast. They are on the verge of extinction on the West Coast and every little bit counts. So managing and improving the quality of habitat for their overwintering areas is hugely important for the bigger picture of trying to promote the long-term sustainability of monarchs. Um, so switching gears again a little bit, um, I want to talk some of these the really cool, exciting stuff that we're doing in the Presidio is the bringing back what was lost. So you probably all heard the term reintroductions. You might have also heard the term translocation, even potentially assisted migration. A lot of these kind mm -hmm. of have a lot of similar in concept, but uh, we need to be very clear when we're defining these terms. So I just want to stick to reintroduction and define it as the intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it disappeared. So this is another really cool example of how museums like California Academy of Sciences are hugely important to understand what the past once was to, um, um, pro sorry, I'm just getting these obscure messages on my computer. That just <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Understanding, so looking back in time, we don't have records other than what is in the, um, 
Sorry, I'm just going to try to close that. There we go. Um, looking back through time, all we have is museum voucher specimens. Uh, without these voucher specimens, we uh, we wouldn't really know what was there. So all these things that are housed on the shelves of the California Academy of Sciences and other things like written records from the early naturalists. Again, there were no cameras back in those days. Yeah. They were drawing them or collecting them, preserving them and stashing them away in a museum shelf somewhere. So that helps us paint a picture of what used to be here. Looking at what we have here today can tell us what was lost and trying to assess why was it lost. Have we addressed those reasons of why it was lost? Therefore, will it come back on its own? Or are we going to have to take matters into our own hands? And should we? And why? So that's kind of a lot of the stuff that I've been doing since I've started in my position over the last about six or seven years is asking all of those questions and starting to really create a list of what wildlife species used to be here, what cannot come back on their own, and what can come back now that the habitat has been built and restored. So I wanna talk a lot about um, bringing back a lot of these things. And again, just another thing is, why would you wanna re reintroduce species? Well, again, we wanna restore those checks and balances and the ecosystem resilience through complexity. So building more complex uh, ecosystems. Uh, we want to fill lost niches. So again, really important for those checks and balances. Um, a niche is a specific uh, role that an organism will play in, an envi in the environment. Uh, we want to, you know, potentially some of these species might serve uh, a really beneficial ecosystem service that could benefit humans directly. And I'll talk some more about that. And then also uh, biodiversity, the inherent nature of it, uh, just in its own right. Why not? Yeah. you know and, and also connecting it with people a lot of these creatures are very inspirational to a lot of people as i talked about earlier and i'll talk more about in a little bit um biodiversity and, and especially animals can be really inspirational to people so an example i want to talk about or i'll just go through a couple uh this is the variable checker spot butterfly it was last yeah. seen in the presidio in 1978 um, again this is closely linked to a host plant um, a couple of host plants the primary one being um California bee plant, another one, sticky monkey flower. Uh, there's a chemical component in those plants that the caterpillar consumes, and it actually makes it unpalatable to predators like birds. And you can see that reflected in the color pattern, reds and yellows and blacks is a huge, uh, or is very common color pattern in nature as a warning to predators. So um, that, that, that chemical component of that plant is expressed in the, the, the organism itself. And so, it was lost because of it went locally extinct, aka extirpated in the Presidio, primarily due to habitat loss, again, losing its host plant, and not only the host plant, but also the nectar resources for the adults. Um, and this is a fairly, I'd say medium-sized butterfly, maybe two and a half inches uh, in, in width, uh, but a lazy flyer. Unlike the monarchs that can fly hundreds of miles, this butterfly is a low flyer, Lazy flyer. It, there's no way that it could fly across the city of San Francisco from its nearest host plant, uh, nearest uh, population, um, a couple miles, about seven miles south of the city. It can't do it. The only way to get it back is to physically bring it back. So in 2017, we actually went to the one of the closest populations and collected a bunch of cat, thousands of caterpillars right off the host plant, the California bee plant, put them in a cooler, drove them over to the Presidio. And literally within within an hour, just plop them straight back onto a host plant. And so we started that in 2017. And this is just some of our monitoring data. We monitor all of these projects because we want to know, are we succeeding? Do we need to keep bringing in caterpillars or can we stop? 2016, obviously, there was nothing there. The project hadn't started yet. So you look at the x-axis is the year and the y-axis is the, the estimate numbers of individuals. And I'll just say these are estimate numbers of flying adults. That's what we count. We walk transects and count how many adults are we seeing on the wing. 2017, the first year of release, this is just at one site, we saw 186. Mm -hmm. We moved about, I think, a thousand caterpillars. 2018, we had not only the breeding from 2017, but we also brought in more caterpillars. You see an increase of 864. 2019, we didn't bring any caterpillars in. This was purely on their own. They were breeding on their own now, and it was a bump up to 1,280. And that's just a little fraction of where we monitor. This is another example uh, through space. You can see we released them at two sites. This is the Presidio looking uh, north is up. 
Uh, we released them um, in their one patch on the bottom right of the coastal scrub habitat, which is where their host plant is associated with coastal scrub, and on the left, more coastal scrub. The flight season 2017, these are observations that we took and posted on inaturalist.org and or the community that just walks around the Presidio helped us out and just took pictures. So I just want to show you through time how they spread across space. 2018, 2019. That's what we want to see. We want to see them spreading throughout the habitat on their own. They're hopping over to all these other patches of restored habitat where they're finding not only their host plant to lay their eggs, but also nectar resources for the adults to continue their flight and to breed. So this is a really cool example of a successful reintroduction project. Really? And here's a here's another example, or just a, a picture of what I was looking at, the, the west side of the park. I don't know if you can see my mouse. You mm -hmm. can. So yeah. you see that valley right there? Mm -hmm. That's coastal scrub, that's Lobos Valley. That used to be a blimp hanger and a baseball field. And that was one of the first restoration projects of the Presidio around late 90s, 2000. And then here up here, there's another patch. This used to be a dumping ground and a tennis court. And that was restored and now is dune habitat. And then you see back here behind these apartments and on the coast up here, that's what we call remnant habitat. That never got developed and never got destroyed. Um, it got you know a little degraded, but it was still there for thousands of years. We released the butterflies just in this one patch behind those that big building right there. And they flew, they, they hopped over the road and established in the Lobos Valley. And then they also hopped over to these remnant patches and they continue to spread through the coastal scrub habitat. Really cool example. Yeah, yeah, really exciting. And I wanna just jump in and say too, there's, we've got some really, really good questions coming in. They are mm -hmm. bigger, so I think they're good to save for the end, but we okay. do see them, keep asking them. Yeah, that's Perfect. It. How are we doing on time? Oh, we've got mm, like 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, well then I'm gonna have to race through this because- uh, Well, we let's have you, you know what? Let's just have you back for part two because people are really, really loving this. So honestly, like I think if you hit a place where you're like, and this is good for part one, we'd really um, love to have you back. Well, so <laughs> I could, oh man, this is tough. I could probably get through this in 10 minutes. And okay. Just, and just kind of give the broad overview and we can go right. in depth in part two. So That's I good. just want to segue with this picture in the bottom right here is a lake. It's called Mountain Lake. It's a natural lake, it's about 2,000 years old that we've been restoring over the last several years. We inherited a cesspool of a lake that had annual fish die-offs and all kinds of problems like mosquito outbreaks. So we started to address all of these problems. And our ultimate goal was to restore water clarity and ecosystem health and function so that we no longer have this nasty cesspool in the middle of an urban area where kids were playing uh, and we had all kinds of problems. So this is a idealized version of the community that we aspire to restore. Um, a lot of lost wildlife through time and a lot of aquatic vegetation was lost through time. So before we were able to do that, we had to address the drivers of decline, including runoff from a golf course that was built in the 1800s, nutrient runoff, which which fuels algae blooms, which just d decreases and declines water quality, which impacts all kinds of biodiversity. Um, invasive species such as these fish were released and people's unwanted pets were also released, um, including the, and, sorry, this, I should have uh, no, don't rush. Off the beforehand. I'm <laughs> getting fine. all these messages from a meeting that's happening right now. Anyway, uh, <laughs> people's unwanted pets were coming in and causing all kinds of problems, including introduced diseases, et cetera, out competing a lot of the native wildlife. And then they built the highway one that leads up to Golden Gate Bridge, literally right on top of the lake, decreasing the size of the lake and also a lot of uh, runoff from the highway going into the lake. All kinds of problems. We addressed these over the years. And so after addressing these issues, we were able to start to reintroduce a lot of lost wildlife, including this Western pond turtle. With our collaborators at San Francisco Zoo, they started a Head Start program, uh, rearing baby turtles under the most ideal conditions that a baby turtle could want to get them past that vulnerable stage. Uh, when they're this big, the size of a, a silver dollar, they can be eaten by anything and everything. So you wanna get them past that vulnerable stage and then release them. We did that and we're continuing to monitor. We did that in 20, 15 and continuing to monitor their population through time. Uh, Pacific chorus frogs were almost extinct in the city of San Francisco, uh, but because of our habitat restorations, um, really primarily the aquatic uh, habitat where they can lay their eggs and where their tadpoles can develop, um, including Mountain Lake, we now have thriving populations in the presidio of these chorus frogs. Um, 
Three spine sticklebag is the only native fish that we knew to have occurred in the lake. And we collected some locally from the creek that runs along the southern border of the Presidio, Lobos Creek. And we moved them and allowed them to reproduce in the absence of all of the invasive predator fish that we removed. And they took off immediately, started breeding. And not only are these really uh, beautiful fish, they're really small, but they're very beautiful, the males. Um, they also help us, again, they provide an ecosystem service. They actually eat and consume mosquitoes. And we don't want to have mosquito problems in the middle of the city. So they help us control mosquitoes. They also have a really important role with these, uh, what are native freshwater mussels. Um, these mussels are can get fairly large, and unlike marine mussels, they don't live attached to rocks like those oysters I was talking about. They actually live in the sediment, and they can move around in the sediment. Um, but they're also really interesting because they're actually parasites of fish. They need fish to complete their life cycle. The, the, the larvae are booted in the gills. They're released into the water. They attach to the fins of the fish. They absorb. They're called glycidia. They absorb nutrients from the fish before ultimately dropping off. And you can see on the left, tiny, tiny little microscopic mussels, glochidia. Um, if you don't have the host fish, you do not have the mussels. You need the host fish, which the stickleback is a suitable host. Not only are they really interesting and bizarre in their parasitic life cycle, but they also have a really important functional role in the ecosystem, AKA ecosystem service. They are filter feeders. They're constantly filtering like the oysters do, constantly filtering and cleaning out the water. This is a cool example on the left, no oysters on the right, or excuse me, mussels, no mussels on the left, and on the right, presence of mussels. They actually clean our water. And not only that, not only do they clarify the water, but we have a collaborator at Stanford that showed that at Mountain Lake, they actually removed E. coli from the water. And we had had an E. coli issue at the lake. So they help us clean up this water. Again, that's one of our goals of the restoration of Mountain Lake is to clean the water. We're also uh, restoring and reintroducing the uh, rarest damselfly in North America, the San Francisco fork-tailed damselfly. Mm -hmm. um, with our collaborators at San Francisco Zoo, a captive breeding program, they've been breeding them and releasing thousands of these naiads, which is the aquatic stage, the juvenile stage of damselflies. Again, these animals are voracious predators and they help us control things like mosquitoes. So another ecosystem service is their control of mosquitoes. Um, and the biggest part of my job is the human dimension, connecting people to nature. Uh, and so at Mountain Lake, we use these these really cool stories and these charismatic animals, like the mussels, very charismatic animals. They are, Just kidding. yeah. Just kidding. Just <laughs> I kidding. think they um, are. But you the, mean the, charismatic. The, the story of the turtle is really our ambassador species. And we started this social um, this uh, social program, social marketing was called, to try to inform people through these charismatic animals and the stories of those animals to, uh, you know, how do we as humans impact these animals? And so we started this campaign, uh, behavioral change, um, and using these things, uh, what we would call ambassador species, such as the Western pond turtle, to really connect the urban audience to these urban conservation action stories and telling these stories of why, why do we lose these species and how are we bringing them back, bringing nature to these urban uh, audiences and really trying to inspire the next generation of, of, of young people primarily, but not just young people, all different pe kinds of people, all different walks of life live around this area and come to these, these this, this national park. And based on what we know, because of the records in California Academy of Sciences, we know we lost a tremendous diversity, uh, as I said earlier, throughout San Francisco, including the Presidio. So all of these species that are showed here are opportunities for future projects that some of them we're working on right now. No spoilers, because maybe I'll talk about that in future programs. Yeah. But we're, we have all these opportunities now that the habitat has been restored and or created. Can we bring back what was lost? And again, if so, why and how do we do it? Really cool opportunities that not only bring this action to urban audiences, but also allow us to um, experiment through scientific the scientific process and, uh, and learn more about these uh, species so that we can apply conservation science to other programs that are not in the Presidio. So how do we learn lessons from the projects we do here in the Presidio so that we can try to apply these lessons learned to other projects across the planet? And um, I don't have time to go into it, but maybe you'll invite me back for a coyote specific program. <laughs> but I just wanted to show you uh, some of the really cool um, shots of coyotes. They have a very important ecosystem service role to play through their predation of, again, these small 
rodents that we would consider pest species. And coyotes, yes, they are here in the Presidio and they do breed and we do have a very robust monitoring program to monitor and manage coyotes and specifically conflict with humans and more specifically coyotes and conflict with dogs. And we've come a long way since I've started this monitoring management program of coyotes. And um, so I can't get into the details now because we just don't have time. But um, a lot of things are going on in that front as well. And then so uh, I, I guess I'll end it there. And this is just a gratuitous shot of a gray fox because it's a really cool rare species in San Francisco. And I, this was the first fox that was seen in the Presidio in I think it was about 10 or 12 years. And um, they come and go. But uh, another example of if you build it, they will come. So. I'm gonna end there because I think we're just on time. <laughs> and um, if you want, if you have time, uh, you can share that uh, coy that coyote clip of the pups um, if you think you have time, or we could just jump into uh, Q and A. Well, I think that we should probably we should probably okay. watch a little of it just because it's pretty pretty fantastic. So right? this is a sh this is a shot some shots that we again using technology to monitor the wildlife camera traps. These are automated cameras. This is this year's uh, litter of pups, and you can see. They actually steal uh, miscellaneous things from some of the residents, like whatever that toy is. But we'll find at the den site, you know, stolen footballs and, and, and shoes. And that's the, that's the alpha female. You can see she's got a tracking collar on her. So we track their movements. And um, again, this, uh, this kind of monitoring allows us to, uh, you know, how many pups were born this year? Uh, right. Three for this year. We've gotten as high as eight in years past. And so at a certain size and age, we'll catch those pups and we'll, we'll put temporary tracking collars on them because we want to know um, where they're going, what's their ultimate fate, do they survive, how long do they survive for. We take a variety of health screening samples, so we draw some blood. Um, what kind of diseases have they been exposed to? Are they carrying yeah. any kind of pathogens of concerns, things like that. Yeah. So all that yeah. information helps us manage. And again, our ultimate goal is to reduce conflict with dogs and coyotes. So. This information plugs back into our management strategy, and we've really come a long way in reducing conflict between coyotes and dogs through all that we're learning through our, our monitoring program. Yeah, well, you're you are 100% officially invited back for part two and part three if you want. We, I can't tell you how many folks do do really want to hear more, and we're so inspired by this. Um, cool. And, you know, I want to ask. I feel like this question from Allison is a, just a really good one to ask, which is. Um, can Jonathan say something about how restoration work has improved or has it become more successful over time? It seems like just 20 years ago, it wasn't considered a realistic solution. Totally. Yeah. That's, that's a, you know, it's restoration ecology is still relatively a new field. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it was, it was the, the concept of it is, is from last century, but it's very much a 21st century um, concept really. And especially when you're talking about urban ecology and urban nature uh, restoration. Um, but yeah, a lot of science has been continuously progressing these concepts and forming these concepts. And a lot of that science is, of course, getting, then being plugged back in through people like myself and my colleagues, because we are practitioners, we are not scientists. We take what the scientists learn and we apply the science to the real world. And we use what we call adaptive management. So we apply the sciences and we learn lessons, whether those are fail, failures or successes, and we adapt as we go along. That's what we call adaptive management, constantly updating and informing our approaches through new sciences and through lessons learned in the application of those sciences. And it's just a tremendous opportunity in that field to continue to grow. There are so many unknowns, so many opportunities, and using a lot of these examples I gave today are really cool examples of opportunities for scientific researchers to learn something new by by the scientific method. I don't have the time to do scientific method and, and designing research programs. I just don't have the time. But that's why I'm always looking for collaborators to, to pull in, mostly grad students. A lot of these are really cool opportunities for grad students. And I'm working with a variety of grad students right now. Uh, UC Davis, we have a PhD student working on the Coyote approach. Uh, we have a student over at San Francisco State looking at um, uh, some of our amphibian work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a, it's just a, a huge field that's just, just on the, the tip of the iceberg and just blowing up in terms of opportunities. Because uh, yeah. again, now more than ever, do we need this, this, this type of information.
Yeah, yeah. And so while we work on picking dates for getting you back, which will take as soon as you have time, by the way, um, is there a website that folks can go to or visit to learn more about the about the Presidio or or any of the ideas you're talking about? Yeah, presidio.gov is our main website. And okay. um, you're gonna have to do some searching on there because uh, we need to we need to improve our web page, but you can find a lot of information on there about these these projects. Um, there's, we have a whole Coyote page, presidio.gov slash Coyote. Uh, and we keep that regularly updated. We also have a YouTube channel, Presidio SF. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of short videos that have been made uh, featuring a lot of these pro projects. Yeah. And more to, more to come, especially that Quartermaster Reach um, marsh restoration project I talk about. Yeah. Um, keep an eyes, uh, keep, keep your eyes peeled for that because there's going to be a lot of media attention on that. And starting yeah. today, actually, there was an article in SF Chronicle on the, the oyster um, program um, that were that I talked about. Um, so more to come. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll drop those links into the comments so people can find them easily later. And you know, people, you know, they enjoyed this so much, and you do explain things so clearly. Um, so we are excited to have you back on. Thank mm -hmm. you for making time. Thanks, viewers, for watching. And keep an eye on our Breakfast Club webpage for upcoming dates, including Jonathan's. Come out, come out and hike the Presidio. Yeah. Okay. Open to the public. Good to, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> we'll see you very, very soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.